Okay, so good, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so yesterday we talked about course introduction. Today we talk about course topic introduction. So what's human computer interaction in general, and in specific for us, we will start to see how the process we're going to follow the human center process I mentioned yesterday is going to unfold along the semester and partially how it also will impact the the project work uh, yesterday i forgot to say two things um, so let me say those two things first uh, the first thing i forgot to say is about group composition uh, i've written the telegram group this morning but let me also say here you can of course use the telegram group to look for members of your team mm. so if you are in three and would like to have a fourth person you can write there a message and maybe someone is still available or you are in two and are looking for other pair of people or another person same or you are alone and you're looking for a group that works as well so feel free to use the question and answer topic in the Telegram group is actually more for you than for us as teacher that topic so feel free to use it also to do this I sent a message saying this uh, this morning in the group but just in case you didn't notice and also you can use the hours here just turn on your left right back or in front of you and say introduce yourself and see if there is anyone looking for still a teammate or two or three who knows um, so maybe it's not easy the telegram group is easier but uh, that's the two options you you have to to form groups and in the end as i said yesterday we can help forming groups not forming groups for yourself so if in the end there are two peoples um, two people on one side the two other people on the other side we can introduce themselves and form a four people group but that is something we would like to avoid and something we will happen at worst like the second of october or the first of october so very so in in a week in a week not before it never happened actually it happens probably once uh last year but typically it doesn't happen so the telegram group and the interaction class is has been enough in the last two years to to solve this goal um, the second thing I forgot to say yesterday we will talk about it tomorrow uh, but was about the high fidelity prototype and was about the technology you can use to create that high fidelity prototype and the technology is whatever you want actually we don't have a preference you can build on what you did in web application one you can decide to learn something else you can it's really up to you to decide as a group to decide what's better for you to uh, realize that project so last year we had a lot of people using web technology to build prototypes so including people using web technology building mobile prototypes mm -hmm. so just a website but looks like and behave like a mobile application mm -hmm. or two years ago we had students using react to create augmented reality application with some difficulties actually uh, due to the libraries available but it's it's all of this is doable because it's a prototype so you can use whatever technology you want that fits your future project idea and solution mm? so in this sense we are agnostic and we are not going to teach you any specific new technology we will help you choose the right technology for you later when we will start assignment number five that is the i fidelity prototype but you are free to explore last year there was a group that was they wanted to learn something new and they decided to use this project to learn react native it's their own decide decision they could have done that in multiple ways they decided to go through the we want to learn something new we are going to do it in react native since it's a prototype of a mobile application they could have done it in react they could have done it in angular 
They could have done in many other way, but they decided to go that direction and they succeeded without any problem. Mm? But it just, again, is up to you as a group to decide at a certain point in the future, not now. Mm? So these are the two things I forgot. Um, so let's start this class with one game. Uh, a game that we will find sometime during the course. Um, and the game is the thing I show you. In this case, what they are. The Google icons for the application, for some of the applications. Um, whatever we see in the screen, we would like to say, this is something that is good enough to be in a Hall of Fame, like the best things we can classify there. Maybe not the first position in the Hall of Fame, maybe the 20th position in the Hall of Fame, but still in the Hall of Fame. Or we want to put it in the Hall of Shame. Again, maybe not the first position as the most terrible things ever produced, but still more on the Hall of Shame part than not on the Hall of Fame part. Hmm? This is um, a game not just for the, the sake of doing this, but to start reflecting and then applying at a certain point some things we will see during the lecture and that you will have to apply on some simple examples. Hmm? So this is easy one, in theory. Uh, these are icons for the Google applications, for some of the Google applications. So where do you put them? In the Hall of Fame or in the Hall of Shame and why? You say all of fame because it's easy to use them what? The applications? The satisfaction for the user. They can use it effectively. They can imply. It's not hard for it to use. What, what is not hard to use? The applications or the icons? No, the applications. But we are talking about the icons. Just look at the icons. You, you don't know what. Imagine you don't know what they, they do. You never open any of these. You just look at the icons on your smartphone or a computer and you see these icons you don't know what happens if you click on any of them or if you tap on any of them you just look at the icons how they designed because someone in google or whatever decided to design the icons in a specific way um, so not the application just focus on the icons all of shame because they are all the same they all look the same very very similar Anybody else? So he is saying all of shame because it's not really clear what the, the picture, the icon per se, independently from the colors, actually do. Mm? If you don't have experience on, on those. Yeah, especially the, the, the drive can be maybe uh, fold a little bit to give another shape. Anybody else? Um, I think it's all of fame, but at low level, because it's simple design, it's the um, four main colors, and the color pattern recognizes us to the user uh, associated with Google services. You say all of fame just in the lower levels in the middle a little bit more on the hall of fame because of the choice of a consistent palette of colors across the icon but yes this is the cons mm. for the abstraction that what he was saying before 
Mm -hmm. uh, there was another, yes. Yes, you have also the, the name of the product, yes. And so, uh, there is like a brand identity, so that uh, at a glance you can see, okay, those are the Google searches, and not uh, Amazon. Mm -hmm. You can recognize, well, those colors are just yes, the same, uh, aligned to what she was saying, um, the colors identify an identity for Google products, and all of fame or shame. You have to pick one. There is no yeah, kind, of shame. kind of shame. Anybody else before we move on? You are saying uh, I'm repeating for the registration um, that once you all of fame because once you get. Uh, to trust one of them, you recognize that they are the same producer behind them, and then the trust is, but this is again more related to the application per se, right, and not for the icon, because if you open it and you don't trust them, then it's the opposite, yeah. right? Um, okay, so this is definitely all of shame, uh, for the reason you said. So of course, the, the problem here, which is a pro in a sense, but this is what would put this in the old shame. So the pro things, the, the advantage is what some of you said, consistency in colors. You recognize that they are all related to each other because they use the same palette of colors, they use the same style, etc. So that is absolutely a adv advantage of this choice. But this is an all of shame because if you, well, these are just five, but Google has much many more products. If you get all of them at a distance, let's say, is not immediate if you're not familiar to understand, as I was saying, that this is Google Drive. Mm -hmm. And that is, this is, what is this? Docs. Google Docs. But on a distance, it's not very different from Google Meet or whatever they are going to call it in the future uh, or now. Um, so they are very similar. If you open all of them, there will be even more similarity. So this is all the shape for these reasons. So good for the choice of color, consistent. So it's an improvement in colors before, uh, with respect to before. These were the previous icons. Mm? So until 2019, there was the top icons. In 2020, they started to deploy the new icons. So the, for the colors, for recognizing the family of products, it's an improvement. But that improvement also uh, abstract things a little bit mo more. Hmm? I don't know, I don't remember which is the icon, for instance, for um, sheet or presentation or other service. But this abstraction actually made the icons more confused for recognizing them. So good again for the consistency of the palette. Mm? They use all the same colors, etc., and familiarity. And once you pick that the colors are this one, when you find another similar color, you say, okay, this should be Google product. That's good. But then they also introduce some confusion in understanding immediately what, which service is uh, one. Then you use them and you get used to them and you recognize them at a certain point, but there is a, a little bit of learning there to use them uh, without error, to select the right one without error, especially if they are all together, okay? So this is a little bit more all of shame. It's not like the terrible thing, but it's a little bit more on the all of shame for this reason. The, they uh, remove the character, the personality in each icon, and they made it flat, hmm? despite, again, having chosen a coherent set of colors to apply to everybody that ever done okay so this is end of the game we will do it again another time with a totally different thing uh, i started with icons because i don't want to show you user interface yet so icons should be easier for these reasons but this already tells you two things one is what you learn what you know 
and the second thing is, is the color are good to have a consistency but too much consistency in colors could also um, imply that you have more difficulty in uh, recognizing one application from the other uh, from the icon then you can have the text and then you can have familiarity you can have other clues that help those okay anything else about this So what we are going to cover today is uh, briefly what is human group interaction, what is usability, uh, which are the user, the human center process I mentioned yesterday, and a little bit how these processes intersect with software engineering process, mm, with software process. So while human group interaction is not only related to software, and we will see some models that apply to the real world, even if there is not a computer behind them, we, you, you do a software engineering course, meaning you will do probably software engineering two course, and you are used to use software. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's good to have a small link uh, with software engineering processes um, for the software part at least. So what's human group interaction? Human group interaction is part of many interconnected concepts in their evolution. Mm -hmm. So when you hear about interactive system, user interface, that is something that is related to human computer interaction. And interactive system, user interface are something that a device expose. Mm -hmm. Because a device has the property to be interactive and to provide an interface to the user. So what is a user interface, by the way? Can we have a definition of user interface? Your definition of user interface? Yes. It's the thing that the user uses. Use. It's a little bit auto-referential, but <laughs> it's not wrong. Maybe it's without using user use. <laughs> A platform or display. or a display that the user can use to do something with a system and that is a graphical user interface right because you have a display but user interface could also be non-graphical right for instance for instance one example of a non-graphical user interface is still graphical terminal right because you you see them is not, um, is a different way of interacting with a graphical user interface, but still graphical. It doesn't have buttons, etc. but you, you see them, you write to them, so it's still graphical, in a sense. Non-graphical, without a display, remove the display. Button. What? The button. Which button? The light. A light button, yes. That's an interface. It's a user interface towards the lighting system <laughs> of the room. It's an interface in general term. Uh, it's not a graphical because you don't have a display. It's a physical, it's a tangible, in a way, user interface. Something non-tangible, non-physical, not... Yes, say it, I don't know who said that. Voice assistant, so Google Assistant, Alexa, whatever. They are not graphical, they are voice user interface because you... Well, some of them have displays, but some of them do, don't, and the main interaction method is by voice. So that's a vocal user interface, a voice-based user interface. But these are all properties of devices. Hmm? A display, um, button, a light, uh, a microphone and a speaker with some capability that provide the user interface. Hmm? Uh, connected to this, there is all another area that we are not going to cover there much uh, that is more related to the mechanical, physical part, human abilities, that is ergonomics, human factor, and the concept of performance and errors. We cannot do everything. We have limits as human beings, and we have um, all a series of studies that is more on the mechanical side that is about the ergonomics. So ergonomic of the seating, ergonomic of the table, ergonomic of the handles of a door, mm? so how things appear and work 
and we can use them. And this is related to the human factors, what we can do, and also the amount of errors and performance these things and us can together combine. And, and all of these are part of what we nowadays call the human-computer interaction. In the past, hmm, synonyms used, especially in the past, they were, uh, well, man-machine interaction was the first definition. You can understand why it's not really used anymore, right? Why? Because the man, so there is no women, machine interaction, just men, the other don't, so it's not really accurate. So they move to human machine interaction, that is a little bit better. Uh, and it's still used, especially when you refer not to computerized system, but to just machines. Mm? So if you are, need to design the dashboard of a tractor without any electronical and computerized system that is a machine. It's purely a machine, a mechanical machine. And then um, you have human machine interaction because you have to interact with a machine, not with a computer. And then a specialization of that, um, that nowadays used mostly as a synonym since computers are actually everywhere in some forms, is human computer interaction. That is what we are going to, to cover. But as you can imagine from what I said, this is a very large domain because it can pass from user interface to turn on the light to website for um, students that need to enroll to an exam at Polytechnico and everything that is in the middle, okay? So within human computer interaction, we will talk about interactive system, user interfaces, devices a little bit, um, a little bit of errors and performance and human factors, and then we will talk about user-centered design that is the um, the oldest, in a way, uh, that has many um, offsprings uh, as a methodology to create things that is centered on people and on people that use them and these are the users of them. So, in brief, what is human-computer interaction as a field? Uh, it is a multidisciplinary field. So when human-computer interaction started, started uh, from people doing computer science and from people doing psychology. Of course, because you have computers and you have people, so you cannot rely only on computer scientists for people. And uh, psychologists didn't know enough, especially at the beginning, to talk about computers and technology. So, that started from mainly these two disciplines, and then in the years, it evolved to include ergonomics, sociology, business, lawyer, technical writer, graphical design, industrial design, etc. So it, it enlarged as a field, and it's multidisciplinary in this sense, and we are going to see some things that you will say this is theory, this is not computer science or computer engineer, but that's because of the human in the equation and of this multidisciplinary that is stemming in, in the field. Um, so before going to the other two points, do you know what are these two pictures? <coughs> Let's start from the top one. What is the top one? Yes. It's a mouse. It's the prototype, since we are talking about prototypes, of the mouse, the one that then was commercialized as, and evolved as the mouse we have nowadays. Hmm? And it took something like 20 or 30 years to move from that stage to the product. Hmm? But this is a prototype. And the second one is a little bit more difficult, I think. It's not a Well, it reminds a tablet, of course. Sorry? A Palmar? No, it's probably the ancestor of that. It's not a. Well, sort of. No, you cannot close. You cannot close it. It's more similar to a tablet of a Palmar. 
that is a picture, but it was also prototyped, never, sell, never sold. And so different from the mouse, the mouse was prototype and then became a product. Deals didn't become a product until we had palmars and tablets nowadays, but this is not a direct uh, link between these and the, let's say, iPad or similar tablets nowadays. But this could be considered an ancestor. This is called Dynabook hmm? and was drafted and um, created. This is a draft from um, a person who is named Alan Kay at Xerox Park in California. Um, and Alan Kay is also one of the person that invented um, object-oriented programming, just to give you a reference. And the idea of this thing was that um, in the 60s, 1960, so not yesterday, um, where we had a computer very different, where they have computer very different from nowadays, hmm? they, don't, they started to have the first personal computers, but was uh, an exception. They don't have internet, there is no Google, no internet. There was started to be Ethernet in Xerox Park because they invented them, but not much of this. Hmm? So internet a little bit in Xerox Park in the US, but not widespread that way. So totally different world. And Alan Kay imagine a device that will be portable with a steel stylus with a keyboard and possibly a screen that is large enough to be on the move and interact in an easy way, easier way than a computer. Uh, and this was thought specifically for children and teenagers and in an educational learning environment. And this was then the precursor of um, clearly the tablets we have today in commerce. And these are two examples of products, ideas that stem from human computer interaction. And so we use the mouse because of the field of human computer interaction. And if you have a smartwatch and you have a keyboard on it, a small keyboard on it, that keyboard works according to studies and algorithm created in research in human computer interaction. That then after a few years became a product and reached the population. So it's a field that has a strong relationship with the built world and real world and people in the end to do something for um, um, for people for some category of people mm? and do you know who created the mouse no it was named Douglas Engelbart that created a system that included the mouse um, for in a project that he called augmenting people intellect something like that and if you are interested in demo and demonstration and launching product and pitch the demonstration of the mouse and all the other things in the system is still called today the mother of all demos because it's particularly well done even if it was done 60 70 years ago so if you are interested in that kind of things the mother of the demo is something you can watch it's on youtube on whatever okay um and if you happen to be to go visit like california in the um, computer history museum they have the ma this mouse there you cannot use it but you can look at it and various other prototypes so back to hci hci is concerned as written here with three things the design the evaluation and the implementation because in the end we need to, to do these things you know, can just think about them but they need to be realized to be used by people hmm? so design evaluation implementation of interacting computer system for human use hmm? um, and together the field also studied the major phenomena surrounding them to understand people hmm? to understand what can be done hmm? technically and non-technically with this technology hmm? and as the name say it involves two entities of course the human and the computer that and this is important determine each other behavior over time hmm? 
So the human, the person, determine the computer behavior, and the computer determine the person behavior over time, of course. Mm -hmm. And this determination of each other behavior is framed in uh, two terms that we will start to see today and then we will meet again that are goals that people have and related tasks, pursuits that match that goal and the person wants to achieve. So let's make an example of goal and task, hmm? which could be one goal and a related task in general in the world that a person can have without exaggerating too much. Small goals and related tasks. Yes. The goal is getting a new car? Yeah, getting a new car is the goal. The task is to pay money. The task, there are many tasks before, many tasks including, yes, getting a job um, first, and then also put money apart and go selling, a, buy a car, exactly. Yes, the goal is a little bit more abstract and the tasks are more concrete and short term in a way hmm, uh, to reach that goal. Um, I can have the goal of going, lunch, going to lunch for instance, and the task is to complete this lecture and then um, open the door, close all these things, open the door, etc., to fulfill this very simple and not really inspiring goal hmm, that I can have. Hmm. And if you think, so you just concluded the exam session, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Were you happy to conclude it at least? Sort of, okay. So not all the exam were, went well, this seems. Okay, so, um, well, when you were in session, before any good or bad news that you received, uh, you had to enroll for the exam, right? Hmm? Yes or not? Yes. And so that day when you decided to enroll to name an exam, system and device programming, that day you turned on the computer, you sit in front of the computer was turned off and you had the goal to enroll to the system and device programming exam. That was your goal, right? For that moment. Uh, and which were the tasks that you do for fulfilling that goal? No, 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 we are in the enrollment phase. We are just before. We are in front of a computer, computer is turned off. I want to enroll to exam. So what I need to do? Turn on the computer. That's one thing. Then mm, open a web browser. Type the address or click to go to the Polito website. Click on the button to log in. It's not like you go on the website and log in, right? You do some actions, so task. Click on the button to log in, and all of these is trivial, and I can understand that, but it's actually things we do, and we do immediately without thinking, but we do, do all of this. And these are all small tasks we do. Um, log in, insert our number, number, username and password, log in, then. You're logged in? I don't know what you do after, after logging in on your, on your part. You, you scroll down a bit. You scroll down a bit. And then you click on the exam On the exam reservation and okay, the, you got the, the point. All these are small tasks. So the goal is enrolling to exam or passing the exam. And then we can have a series of tasks that are smaller in details, like turning on the computer, etc. Or we can have a little bit larger tasks that are like um, login into the portale that will entail turning on the computer, opening the browser, etc., etc., etc. So also logging in, entering the portale is a task. It's just a container of smaller tasks. Mm? So even tasks could be smaller or bigger. Um, we said that HCI is multidisciplinary and 
um, we will try to adopt and build expertise coming exactly from different fields, including design methods and process, models, theories, best practice, conventions, even if conventions are not best practice sometimes, and also experiment and user studies that came mostly from the psychology side of the, uh, of the field. So what is the goal of human group interaction? So the goal of human group interaction is that we want systems that must support the user task hmm, with a focus on its usability. And what we also mentioned yesterday from one colleague of yours is that we want the system to be useful, usable, and used. And we want the three properties together. We don't want something useful, but not usable and not used. And vice versa, we don't want something perfectly usable, but totally useless. So we want these three properties together. And the ingredient to reach this goal are, again, three. The person or the people, the computer or the computers, and the task to be accomplished in some level of um, precision, like the small task, open the web browser, or enter the website, enter the Polytechnical website in the reserve part. So, which are the ingredients of humans and computer? So, humans are, in a way, made by different parts, right? We have a sensory system, an active system, and some cognitive process that derive everything we can do. So, Sensory system, we reported here four. It's the visual system, auditory system, optic system, and spatial system. Hmm? And the active system are our hands, our voice, and our head, our movement, our body, body mov movement. Hmm? And then we have a cognitive process, the perception of things, the perception of, of space, the details we notice with the senses and the memory, our capability to retain information for short, medium or long time, long period of time. And according to you, which is the most used sensory system we use? Which is a sense we use more, most? The visual part. And the second most used? Auditory. The auditory part. Um, which is in general, not with computers, in general. And it's so not surprising that the vast majority of our computer system are visual, because that is the system that as human beings we use most. And then I have a little bit of sound for the auditory part to give feedback and there is anything about optics on a computer nowadays yeah, hmm? uh, yes but the, mm, yes optics here is more yes a little bit optics here is more in the sense of touch the sense of touch the capability of recognizing that this material is different from these and if i put my hand on a fire I got in trouble like that sense is not really used in the computer and what sense is here is missing taste we don't taste anything related to computer yet okay uh, and the computer has their equivalent sensory and acting and cognitive or memory systems um, so the sensory system are the inputs that we can have and the outputs are the active system. So the screen, the audio, uh, vibration, augmented reality, virtual reality that is still related to visual, but is not a screen, is something different, um, speakers, etc. That have both a physical counterpart and a software counterpart in most of the cases. So these are the two entities, and we will need to you should know well the computer entity so we are not going to talk about how computer is done uh, we are not going either to talk a lot about how 
person abilities are done. Of course, these abilities are, in a way, are the human abilities totally replaceable? Like if I'm missing one sensory system, can I compensate entirely with another one in most cases? No. Can I compensate partially? Yes. Actually, yes. If I'm totally missing one sensory system, our body adapt to compensate a little bit with the other. A little bit, not entirely. Hmm? Um, and we can have perfectly working sensory and acting system and not working cognitive process and vice versa. We can have excellent cognitive process and difficulties in sensory and acting system. Hmm? for diseases, for hereditary genetical reasons, for various reasons, for accident. So also temporary, we can broke our arm and in that moment we lose the acting system related to moving the arm and the hand. It's temporary, but it's still uh, something we cannot do for a while. And the computer system, our interface, our application should in a way allow us to still reach the goal. That is, support the user task in a way that is useful, usable, and used. So, in general, um, which are, there are a few models of interaction and there are a few theories of interaction. We are not going again deeply into that. They are pretty theoretical part. But even the word interaction, which we said what is a computer, we said what is a person, but we didn't say what is an interaction. Uh, and if you look at what, how interaction is defined in human interaction, you see that there are many concepts related to interaction. Uh, in some cases, the interaction is a dialogue, a, cycli a cyclic process of communication. In some cases, it is a transmission. I want to send a message to you and you will send back a message to me, still interaction. In some other cases, it is experience related to feelings, memories, um, etc. Or it could be control. I want to control this system, this thing, to have fewer errors possible against some standard. Hmm? I want to make all the checkbox done today in five minutes. Hmm? That's minimizing error, controlling the, the outcome of the operation. So, interaction is not the idea that person and computer are engaged in a way hmm? but again it's it's as I said before it's something that whatever you want to define whatever concept you want to apply it's still two entities different in nature hmm? one created at the other from the other by the other that determine each other behavior over time and their mutual determination can be of many types. It could be statistical, mechanical, and structural, depending on what is this computer doing and what is the task and what is the goal. Hmm? So the ultimate matrix, the things we will, especially in this first week, focus on is user's goal and task. These are the central part we will focus mostly, which are the tasks that we want to accomplish with a computer system to fulfill some goal in a way that is easy, usable, used, and um, uh, useful. Hmm? So let's make some assumption from the rest of this lecture. Um, we have one single person that wants to accomplish some goals in a specific application domain. That is fundamental because each domain has its specific characteristics set of possible processes and goal, artifacts, building blocks, etc. So just to make you an example, if you are doing uh, an application to be used in an hospital by doctors, you will use different concepts, processes, uh, um, decisions, words, then you have to do the same application to be used by uh, um, in the school, the, in the primary school. Imagine that there is a similar application that you want to do the same thing, sign on documents, 
But of course, the processes are different. The domain is different. The context is different. Hmm? So children will need a different language. We will need maybe more colorful things, maybe bigger icons, because maybe not all of them can still read. And they need a way to follow, to fulfill this goal and complete some task. Doctors in an hospital are not, cannot say, oh, let's take 10 minutes to do this, or half an hour to do this. There's another pace, another context. Hmm? So the specific application domain, and together with the goal of the user, determine what the application should be able to do. Let me do another example about jargon. Um, you know what is a CFO, right? CFO. Some knows, some doesn't. What is a CFO? I don't know the English word, actually. There are credits, right? This course is six CFO, six credits. So you know what is a credit, right? Now, go to a first-year high school student and tell them that you are doing a six-credit course. Will they have the same understanding of you what is a credit? No. You will need to explain the word. Hmm? So if you're doing an application for a student at university describing courses, enrolling in courses, you can use credits because that's normal way to do here. If you need to do the same application for high school students, what you will replace credits with? For instance, hours. Hmm? So different jargons, different domain. Maybe very similar application, same goal, choosing a course. So users want to accomplish some goal in a specific domain. We cannot ignore the domain in which we are. And task as operation to manipulate the concept of the domain. And the goal, as we said before, is realized by performing one or more task, as in the example we made before. An interaction studies the, rela the relation between users and the computer, the system, with two fundamental characteristics to keep in mind. We don't, they're not immediately visible, but we need to keep in mind. The system, the computer, has its own state and speaks its own language. That is the computer language, the system language. It's not coding, it's just the, the, the language that it ex exhibits to the user. The person possesses another state, in a way, that includes the understanding of the system state, some intention to perform a task, and speak its own language, that is the task language. I want to choose a course. I want to enroll in an exam. That's my language. That maybe is not the language that the system is using in that moment. And I will have an understanding of the system that could be more or less accurate or not. And that understanding uh, depends on my previous experience with that system or other similar systems. Um, and my the domain in which I am and the context in which I am and the things that happened in my life in that moment. Hmm? Again, if I'm using a smartphone application while I'm late and it's raining, it's very different to use the same identical application while I'm not late and it's not raining. It's just different, not the application, but the context in which the same person is located. In a rush, not in a rush, with an umbrella, without an umbrella. So, speaking of theories, there is uh, one theory that defines the model of interaction between a person and a system that is, was created by Don Normal. This is an explicative, explainable theory of interaction. So explain how things happen, what we do. And as any model is not always 100% accurate and uh, applicable, in the sense that in some cases, most of the operation we are going to, I'm going to tell you are made in a second and without thinking, or some of them are skipped at all, or done just in a way that is subconscious for us. Uh, in other cases, instead, we need to think, again, depending on the context of the domain, etc. So, and again, let me open this parenthesis. I can totally understand, and I've heard this already, that this seems what we are, what we are doing here, what we are listening here, 
Uh, this is part of a certain change of perspective that you are not used to, that we are computer engineer are not used to. Uh, but trust me and follow me for a little bit because that that will be uh, useful in a practical way in in a while. Maybe not today, but in a while. So normal say said that when we interact with a system, com computer system, mechanical system, doesn't matter. We there are two cycles. One is the cycle of the execution, what the person do on the system through the input capability of the system. And the other one is the cycle of the evaluation, what the user perceive back from the system through the output. And Norma say that every time we interact with the system, we do these four steps. We establish our goal, same goal of before. We form the intention, we plan what we can do, which are the options we have. We then specify the exact action sequence, and then we actually do the thing so let's make an example that is classical in normal in normal view let's make two examples actually uh, one is i want to go out of this room hmm? so that's the goal the goal is going out of the room which are the options that i have walk to the door which door Mm? The, nearest the nearest one. That's one option, right? One option is walk to the door. Well, pay attention here and walk to the door. And that's one task, mm? one, one option. Uh, and one option is walk to the closest one. The other option is walk to the other one because maybe I need to go to the other side. So context. Mm? If I need to go that side is fine maybe i can leave also from there in this case there are five doors in this room for apparently no reason um i can decide to open the window and go out that's an option it's not legally acceptable or acceptable in, in general sense but there is probably something behind the the window and so if there is a balcony i can hypothetically open that window and go out of that these are my options and then i need to pick one picking one is specifying the action sequence so let's say they want to go out from the nearest door okay which is the action sequence to to go out of this room through the near to the nearest door what i need to do imagine that you have to tell me how to go out through that door what i need to do I'm, I'm still standing, so I don't, I don't need to get out. Ah, I, I, I need to go there and go out. So tell me, imagine that I'm not able to, to see, and you have to guide me there, from here. What do you need to do? No, no, I don't care. So mind the gap, no, the gap is too far. So I need to walk a little bit. Two steps, three steps, I cannot do it because I'm, I have a microphone, but... I need to walk a little bit, two steps. Then there is a gap. Then? No, I, I, I mean, we are still here, so let's focus on the stair after. Then? So uh, we are all able to go out from the door, right? So, yes? You don't need instruction to do that, no? So to give me instruction, since you are something you are capable of. I'm there just behind the gap then what i need to do to the, right. the right and then walk five steps then turn left walk other i don't know 10 steps then turn right then open the handle is not specific so what i need to do there push the handle not open the handle and then after I push the handle, what do I need to do? No. If I just push the handle with minimal force, the door will not open. I need to push the door, the handle, and continue pushing until the door is open. And then I can go out. So these are, in a way, if, if you have a robot here, this will be the instruction you need to provide to a robot if you are commanding the robot step by step. 
But this is what we do. When we enter the door, we did this operation just in a millisecond, but we went through, okay, I, I'm going to the first door, the second door, the third door, or I don't care, just one door. But we make a deliberate decision immediately in a subconscious way, but we made it. And this applies every time we interact with any system. Um, then the system, sorry, then the system in the evaluation phase do something, the doors open or not. And we perceive the system state, the door is not open, it's closed. We interpret what's going on. Okay, it's open, we can continue. Uh, it's not opening, there is something that is not working. And, and then we go back to the user and according to the operation, we go to another execution. Hmm? So if we go there and push the door, pull the door instead of pushing, uh, we completed the execution because we go there, we add an action sequence, we execute the action, but we pull the door instead of pushing. And so we perceive the system state, the door is not opening. And, and we go back here and we need to not establish the goal because the goal is the same before, but we need to understand how we can change the action sequence to actually go out. And this, when this gap in the execution is wide, so it's more difficult to form the right intention, etc., to actually open the system, this is called a gap in the execution. Um, it's called the gulf of execution in normal words. It's the gap, the difficulty in complete execution. And when instead the difficulty is coming in evaluation, so I did everything correctly, but some way uh, the result is not what I expect, then it is the gulf of evaluation. So the distance between the user and the system that want to do something in a, together in a way. Mm? And we want designing system where the gulf of execution and evaluation are the smallest possible. Mm? So one example of a problem in the gulf of evaluation is how many times, still talking about doors, this was Norman example as well, how many times you go to in front of a door and you pull instead of push or vice versa? It happens or never happened? It happens. Why? Yeah, but why you get confused? No, not you in general. No. What's the difference? What's so first of all, who is the error? The person of the, the door. The domain changed, so you go in front of a door. So that door, how do you open the door? You said you push. How do you know that you push the door? Did anybody teach you that you need to push the door? You had any instructions? The way the handle is designed. You can also have space, but still you need to push. Um, the way the handle is designed. The way the handle is designed is triggers some familiarity in other contexts that tell us that we need to push. These are called affordances. Hmm? So the affordances or the door say that we need to push. And when we go through a door and we pull instead of pushing and the door doesn't open, is because the affordances of the door are wrong. Not we are wrong. We formulated the right intention and the action sequence according to our experience in our context, but the door design and the handle design as the affordances of a pulling po door instead of a pushing, and so we pull. And how this can be solved, how this is solved on doors? Putting on the sign. We're putting a sign, pull or push, exactly. Because this, the real solution will be change the door, but it's much more expensive than putting a sign and so they when people don't get out or in they will put a sign so that 
at least there is an indication. But this indication is an indication of the gulf of execution of the evaluation is not working because I'm there pulling the door and the door is not opening, so I'm interpreting the system, I'm evaluating the system, and then I will think, well, if it's not that direction, it would be the other one, and I would try the other direction, but it's the second try. And then if it's not open even in the second direction, then I will maybe start looking for a button, a keyboard, a key, a key knob, something to, to unlock the door, probably. Hmm? But these are getting stuck in this loop to complete a simple operation that is um, opening the door. Uh, one other small example. I want to turn, on, turn off the light in this room. How can I do that? Which are my options? Yes, where is the switch? There is one here, yes. Or two, I don't know. And here I have a collection of four switches. Well, there is like seven, but um, three are, uh, two has a, num um, a label to say zone one and zone two. So let's say there's a label. That's already uh, an explanation that is something not working, right? Because there is a label. Um, so what is zone one? Who knows, actually? We can guess. So here we are in a problem in the Gulf of execution because we actually, we don't know. I want to turn on this light. Which button should I press? The zone one or the zone two? I will guess that is, for instance, zone one. And apparently not. Um, so, see, interpreting the state of the system, the lights doesn't, didn't turn off. So, and we are stuck in the circle here. Hmm? This applies with doors, with lights, and with computer system. Every time you do some operation and you don't see a result that is clear, and then you're stuck here in this model. Hmm? Um, well, then Norman also did other uh, diagrams. Um, the, but they, they are, again, the, the same operation as before. Uh, this diagram also can give us some clue on how to reduce the bridge of execution. So if you are observing some people having trouble in fulfilling a goal in the real world, and the trouble is in the planning stage, that is the first one, then you can know that there is something to do on the planning stage and not on the other stage. And if you are troubled performing the operation, because it's the end all is too, um, is too hard, or the button is not visible, or whatever, then you know that you have to fix something in the performing part and not in the intention or in the planning of the person. Similar for the other things. Uh, then, above then bail, take the same model and just make explicit um, saying that the system can have the, its own language, but the user interface can have a different language in the system. And just explicit that the user interface is separate and that could contribute um, to, uh, to such difficulties and also split the execution and evaluation in other four um, layers, articulation, performance, presentation, and observation, because it put a user interface in the middle. Uh, so, when errors are in the Gulf of execution. Human errors uh, are never human errors, are always system errors. Let's use this assumption. Um, if there is a problem, the problem is of the system, not of the person. And uh, there could be two kinds of errors, the slips and the mistakes. The slip are you have formulated the right action, but failed to execute for any reason. So you click on the, you know that you have to press an icon, but you click on the wrong one. So that icon is there, you identify that, but by mistake you click another one. Or you are double clicking too slowly, so the action is not performed. And so this can be corrected in the system, for instance, with a better interface, more spacing, uh, a different layout, highlighting the icon, the button to be pressed, etc. And then there are, so slips are minor errors. And then there are the mistakes. Um, that happens when you don't know the system well and you may not formulate the right goal and the right set of tasks. So, for instance, you click on the lens 
for zoom because you are used to clicking on the links for getting zoom but in that application means search mm? so it's your clicking that is wrong uh, and in this case it said that the user mental model of the system state is not correct mm? so our representation of our system should work is not the one that match with the reality that is again what happens when you go in front of a door and it has wrong affordances and you cannot open the door it's your mental model of how a door operates that is not aligned with the actual doors for a problem with the door in this case different from slips this requires more radical redesign or additional training mm? it depends on the application at hand mm? so the lips are easy to fix mistakes are more significant and will require um, a, a, a bigger effort as i said before human errors should never be considered fault of the users rather they are usually a result of bad design wrong affordances bad design bad layout and clear words for the context and the domain etc uh, also because people you know people people i can resume and uh, summarize that the people are a mess in many cases so we tend to be imprecise distracted for whatever reason and non omniscient and and so system design should anticipate the messiness of the human experience in a way and minimize the chance of an inappropriate action maximizing the possibility of discovering and repairing any errors missed as leaps we make in the application and we also system should enable us to understand its own state and build an appropriate mental model of the system so this is all properties that the system the user interface should exhibit to be usable useful and used uh, here there is an example about switches um, but it's similar to the example i um, I mentioned to you here is just more um, difficult so here you go this is an house you got in this house this house was entirely automized doors open with buttons windows open with buttons you, you press buttons to do everything in that house and they put these uh, buttons here and with some icons without labels and if you need to find so what what happened here that the person need to find a button to open the main door and what typically is done is that what i did with zone one and zone two pressing all the buttons until the doors open because it's not clear which is the button and how they solve the problem from the picture how they solve the problem of indicating which is the right button they label it they put a piece of paper say this is like door main door uh, and because the colors were totally random probably the electrician ended the gold plaque and started to use the red plaque but there is no reason why and and the pictures were not clear enough to, to represent that um, here there is an example what is this what? this is font format from Microsoft Word here there is an error in presentation so checkbox what means what checkbox means in the behavior how many checkbox you can select all of them in theory by the specification of checkbox you can select all of them no you cannot have a uh, something that is both superscript and subscript you, you cannot it's either one or the other so the application works well in Word, if you select superscript and then try to press subscript, it deselects the other. So the logic is, is correct. The presentation is not. Hmm? And this is some, a product of Microsoft that still has this kind of presentation problem. Hmm? So it's not something that happens only to small entities, also to big global industries. Hmm? Um, so this could be replaced a couple with um, well either drop down or single selection instead of checkbox 
and similar here you cannot have something that is small caps all caps and hidden in the same moment um, and we also have in considering these various user interface style we mentioned before two of them we mentioned the command line interface as a kind of graphical user interface and here there are others style of interface menus are a different style of interface menus that you have in the application natural language is a style for user interface uh, question answer and the query dialogue like querying a database etc is another style of user interface you submit something you get an answer uh, form filling like the form for filling the group is a way is a user interface um, style um, mobile touch is another style points and click is still another style when you move the mouse and click somewhere and 3d interface is yet another style and then there is the classical computer style that's called the wim that stand for windows icon menus and pointer that put together some of these styles in a coherent framework it is a framework we still use on computers nowadays because we have windows we have icons we have menus in the windows and we have the pointer that is the mouse pointer so this is the, the major us style that we either use or we can design for uh, quickly there are many user-centered design processes the the oldest one is called just user-centered design that say you should take into consideration actual users at every single step every single phase of your design process in realizing something every single one and this is estimated uh, that actually benefit um, the product the results and estimated that 50 percent of the problem in a project are due between the communication between the developer and the user or the client 50 percent of the issue are not technical issue are communication issues so involving the actual end user in all stage minimize this problem until zero the problem is it's difficult to include different end user at every single step is time expensive is money expensive is expensive in many many ways hmm? but the idea of user center design is still important and it was evolved over time for instance participation design is a more evolved framework than user center design in which users are not just involved they are designer itself they are creator itself in a specific controlled way hmm? but this is another framework for design another process for design agile interaction design borrows idea from the agile methodology from software engineering and put together um, some concept of the user-centered design um, with pros and cons design thinking is the newest block um, on processes that defined five stages from emphasizing, defining, ideate, prototype, and test, and repeat some of these uh, in an iterative process. Mm. So we are not going to follow, and then there is also service design that move from the product to services. Like you don't sell a dishwasher, you sell the application, the online service, the, the recharge, and the dishwasher. You, you sell a service, and so you want to design something for the entire service uh, we are not going to use any of this specific maybe if there is, there is a human computer interaction two course we will adopt one of these but we take the common denominator from them and the basic elements the key elements that are summarized in this simplified and generic process but these steps are present in all of those other processes so <laughs> one step um, that's similar to what design thing call emphasize uh, it's what is needed the first step then there is an analysis of these needs in some way then we have to design something a prototype and evaluate the prototype and circle a few times here user-centered design involve users at any 
step of the process. So here we have an evaluation of some kind. So we circle here and at a certain point we say enough with prototype and we go out and implement and deploy the final product, the real product. Mm -hmm. So in this course, these are the basic elements of all the previous um, system and processes. In this course, what we're going to do is basically following this process, except the final product stage. So we will start with a need finding. You will analyze the results from the need finding. You will design and prototype the low fidelity prototype. You will evaluate through an heuristic evaluation. So not a user evaluation, but a guidelines based evaluation. The prototype, maybe will change something so you will adapt the design and go on with the second prototype and then you will do a user evaluation in that moment and then the course is over basically so we will do two complete iteration of this cycle with two level of fidelity of prototype you can do many more according to what you you need and what you need to learn from a specific prototype that we will see along the course um, usability that I mentioned before is actually a standard, an international standard that is defined as extent to which a system, a product service can be used by specified users so not general purpose users, not everybody but specified users to achieve specific goals with effectiveness, efficiency and satisfaction in a specified context of use and you see that what we said before, the goal, the user, the domain, are actually still here in the standard ISO definition. Uh, with two notes, because this is a standard definition. And usability in a more colloquial, if you want, definition could be said how well a user can use the system functionality. And this well is a matrix that could be quantitative or qualitative and we will learn how to evaluate this matrix, this well hmm? and there could be many dimensions of usability usability could mean usefulness does it do the, si the system, does it do something that people want and need it is easy to learn or you need to spend 50 hours to learn how to use a system it's memorable every time you need to relearn again or rem remember how to do things is effective and efficient hmm? uh, the system the state of the system is visible the affordances of the door are visible are clear hmm? the buttons are there i know how to go back i know how to end this process i know how to go out hmm? is visible the state of the system if there is an error it's clear that we are in a narrow state or not visibility errors are errors of the system few and recoverable or it appears a screen that say error that's it and you have to just close the window and start again or it's recoverable you can go back and satisfaction it is enjoyable to use or it's a pain to use these are all dimensions to keep in mind for usability and for also creating your project uh, as i was saying yesterday one thing to keep in mind is, especially with the graphical user interface, is don't make me think. So if I go through a set of switches and I don't know which one to press, I need to think or try by errors which one is the right one. Ideally, I shouldn't. I should be good there and say, okay, this, I'm 100% sure that if I press this, this happens. And this should be true always and also in graphical, in computerized system, not only in the physical world. Hmm? So don't make me think, is the title of that book that I mentioned yesterday, but it's also something that is an increased usability. The less people need to think about different decisions on your application or system, the easier it is the system to learn, to use, and higher usability. Uh, here there is a description of the human-centered design process. Um, basically the need finding is about what exactly is the need and it will be the topic of tomorrow to, we we'll start tomorrow of talking about um, need finding then we need a way to structure and formalize and present these needs and this will be topic of next week where we talk about storyboard and tasks 
Uh, and then there is the design and the prototyping phase in which according to the level and the purpose of the prototype we will do something different but of course we will iterate between design uh, prototype evaluation etc and then finally the implement the final implementation and deployment to the real world that we will of course skip in the process in uh, in this course the last set this la these last five slides show how human computer interaction what i said before intersect with the software process um, is not is more a curiosity than a necessity in this case um, but the key message you can have a look at them and we can discuss if you're more curious but the key message is that human computer interaction is typically in general then there is the agile interaction design process but in the agile normal let's say in the scrum uh, process is typically always a step ahead mm? so one cycle of need finding one cycle of prototyping could always happen before every design step before any implementation step before any analysis of the requirement step before moving to the next stage it could be an evaluation step with users with heuristics with principle with best practice so again some criteria mm? this could always apply independently from the software engineering process you want to to adapt mm? and of course usability uh, safety and performance are part of the non-functional requirements so they are included in a uh, software engineering process by by default and by definition and including and then i will stop here including human with interaction step in a software process is demonstrated that can anticipate critical decision point that can emerge later in the process and doing some extra effort in this sense demonstrated to be cheaper than fixing problem afterwards when they um, appear when you maybe have a product released in the world with clients that are not happy of the, pro the product and you um, are not happy not to have spent maybe one week at a certain point or three days at a certain point doing something different keeping people in the mind so here there are a few slides there is also an example um, if you want to have a look not again not fundamental just more of a curiosity if you uh, if you want um, and with that we close today lecture tomorrow I remind you we have three hours the first hour and a half where we start talking about need finding and especially problem definition that is the first things you you have to do and the second one the second hour instead will be just about your project and how the project unfolds along the semester to give more clarity and guidance overall so these are two separate they say lecture you can uh, is one is not the following up or the second one and the second one is just um, is more it's easier and so that's why we do that and the second hour instead of the first one with that uh, have a nice afternoon and evening and see you tomorrow